Good afternoon again, every good afternoon again, everyone. I would like to uh, bring this committee out of recess and back to order and uh, turn it over to you, Parker. All right, well, we have Dr. Tate here with us and he's ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Tate. How are you, sir? Good. Would you please give us a five minute overview of how your experience has prepared you to be president of LSU? Well, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity and actually I'm gonna to go to your uh, LSU alma mater to answer your question. It's gonna inform my remarks. Specifically, uh, I'm gonna to try to bring the heat and uh, heat in this case, um, H-E-A-T, um, is gonna stand for what I'm gonna describe. Uh, the first part of it is history. Um, there's a wonderful line in the alma mater that reads, fond memories that waken in our hearts a tender glow. This is a call to engage history. The H in heat is for history. And James Baldwin argued that the history is in us and forms our, our identity. Like the Louisiana Purchase Agreement, I'm a product of a Jeffersonian compact. Thomas Jefferson called for the state that he loved, Virginia, to seek out its residents with some talent and provide them with an education. I am here because the states of Illinois, Texas, and Maryland invested in higher education in me. I attended public higher education institutions that mirror those in the LSU system. At NIU, I was provided access to an education that offered an affordable price point for a financial situation that I was in, as well as two undergraduate research experiences that launched my interest in being a professor while earning a degree in three years. Jefferson's Compact worked for me. I should note that during this period of time, I took a business class with Chancellor Larry Clark. He might not remember this. He served on NIU faculty teaching business law. I can say with cert certitude, sir, that that course informed my decision to study economics and the mathematical sciences. <laughs> Subsequently, I headed to the University of Texas at Dallas. At that time, my textbooks were more expensive than the tuition. Again, affordability opened the doors for me. The compact was at work. And finally, at the University of Maryland uh, College Park, I served as a Patricia Roberts Harris Fellow that supported my doctoral studies. The affordability compact for my undergraduate years to PhD education aligned with the Jeffersonian principle. It changed my life. Again, history, in my case, aligns with affordability. It is in the fabric of the leadership DNA that I operate with and a critical part of how I think about leading in higher education. Experience. Another powerful phrase in the LSU alma mater reads, all praise to the alma mater, motor of mankind, motor, one who shapes. The E in heat is experience. Relevant experience matters. In my experience as a teacher, a scholar, an academic, elite, an academic leader, aligned with the phrase in the LSU alma mater, I am a motor, one driven by three values, truth seeking, empathy, and courage. And you all deserve to have a motor at the helm of this great university system. I checked the box for successful leadership experiences at major research universities, where service as a faculty member, chair, center director, dean, vice provost, and executive vice president for academic affairs have afforded me with special insights into the interdependencies of the university and a system such as yours. My formative experiences as a postdoctoral fellow and in the tenure track at the University of Wisconsin and Madison's and in the University of Wisconsin system shaped by two major concepts, one shared governance and the other the Wisconsin idea. I know we'll talk more about shared governance, but more about the Wisconsin idea. It's a simple concept really, it's that the University of Wisconsin should impact the lives of every single resident in the state of Wisconsin. That's who I am, that's what shaped me. My aim is a collaboration with you all to mold and shape an LSU system that increases its impact in terms of human capital development, research, clinical and health services, and collective problem solving. Moreover, I'm committed to rural and urban communities served in the spirit of the alma mater. Attainment. Toward the end of the alma mater, the phrase, our worth in life will be thy worth. Worth. Stated in education terms, worth equals attainment. 
Attainment is the A in heat. Like this powerful phrase, my research, mentoring, and teaching experience in the academy have taught me that the contributions of our students to society make the great experiment called the university one of the world's most cherished institutions. And these lessons translate to academic leadership. Think for one moment about a world without the contribution of LSU students. Recently, one LSU professor inducted into the National Academy of Inventors described the contributions of one of his students. He stated she designed one of the reactors for the Lunar and Mars missions for NASA. How many more people are like that? The list goes on and on. Attainment matters. Tradition. The alma mater ends with, and may thy spirit live in us forever, LSU. Colleagues, tradition matters. As a leader, I commit to supporting the traditions of excellence at LSU while working in a collaborative fashion to forge new pathways. My history with affordability, successful experience in relevant institutional context, a laser focus on attainment and a respect for tradition. Heat is what I bring to this position. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I call on uh, Professor Gabriela Gonzalez for the next question. Thank you. Good afternoon. What's your vision for LSU as an eight institution system, including LSU Act Center and Health Centers? Please describe short and long term goals and metrics for measuring your success. Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, having done a little homework in the spirit of discipline, because I believe most universities lack it, and I want to speak about discipline a bit here. Um, I read that there's a big six in terms of the LSU plan, um, the advancement of arts and culture, uh, coast and energy and environment, research and development, improving health and well-being, translating education and developing leaders. Um, as I looked at those big six, I thought they pretty much captured the spirit of the challenges in the state. However, what was not clear to me was whether that was for the flagship institution or for the totality of the system. Um, and I want to be transparent with you, not being mean spirited, that was problematic because it should, because those are actually um, very good challenges that should be system challenges. So let's assume we're going to be disciplined and hold to those. And I'm willing and perfectly fine with doing that because I think they nailed it. There was a second document that talks about uh, statewide strategies dealing with access, retention, attainment uh, re with respect to undergraduate and graduate education. So let's now marry those two documents and say that those two documents actually sufficiently describe the kinds of things that the system should be engaged in, not just the flagship, but the flagship and the totality of the system. I would say you have a, a, a great uh, start and it would it'd be right there where I would start laying out the metrics. I wanna say to you that the language was causal, which was quite interesting as a social scientist. We will do this and this will happen. I think that's quite ambitious, and uh, I probably would change the language a tad bit. And moreover, let's just talk about metrics quickly. Um, the one thing that I know that LSU, the University of South Carolina, and all the rest of us who are in higher education fail to do in terms of delineating metrics, we create the metrics for ourselves, and we never create the metrics for the people who we actually are responsive to. That would be our General Assembly, the legislative body, in your case, parish by parish. So as a GIS person, epidemiologist, I would suggest that every single metric that's delineated actually be done in geospatial fashion by parish, demonstrating the cost benefit of the investment of the university and, and the investments that have been made into the university and how they translate um, parish by parish in the totality of this uh, state of Louisiana. But failure to do that is not, uh, it's, it just doesn't make sense because every time, and we're gonna talk about raising money in a second, you've got to demonstrate who is my neighbor. It's a biblical question. Everybody wants to answer it. You've got to demonstrate how you're helping your neighbor. And the only way to do that is to show them in a pictorial fashion. So metrics are one thing, but I really want to focus uh, specifically on being able to demonstrate in visual fashion what is being accomplished. That said, I pretended like I didn't read those documents to answer your question in another way. And what I would say is that there are several things that I would probably want to measure and get a handle on. Number one, 
I would want to understand the strength of the system and how strong is the LSU system in comparative fashion, including um, its flagship status. And when I think about that, there are several kinds of metrics that, that come about that I, I began to, to look at. Obviously, as an academic, I'm very interested in uh, the production of the faculty and how well, how well they produce. Citations by FTE controlling for size are extremely important. Uh, research dollars uh, divided by FTE controlling for size of institutions. Uh, in doing so, I, I took a quick look at the relative standing of LSU uh, in the SEC. Right now, on most of those metrics, LSU sits in the middle. Uh, really, uh, with uh, Auburn or US, USC, where I am um, on the top, and you know you're beating Alabama and a few other places, a few other schools. So sits, you sit right in the middle on most of the research productivity measures in the in the SEC, and I think you could do better. Quite frankly, um, that's that's what I'm really passionate about. The research part of this, I think the institution could be better, um, and so partly I think you have to measure that. I think you also have to continue to measure access and, and do it in geospatial fashion. Um, I think that it's extremely important um, that the flagship, the comprehensives and the medical institutions be ranked and thought about uh, in singular fashion, but then also the interdependencies that manifest themselves. And that might require some different kind of methodologies to do, but I do believe that it's possible um, to do it. And I think that the economic aspect of uh, the, um, enterprise should be done. Most institutions talk about the economic uh, gains that they provide, but the relative strength of the system with respect to the state's uh, GDP per capita should be done. It should be done on a regular basis. Those are the kinds of things I think should be measured. And then using that information, not only to guide um, changes, but also to uh, engage with the uh, individuals who are responsible for appropriations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nelson, would you please ask our next question? Yes, good afternoon, Dr. Day. Please describe afternoon. your leadership style with emphasis on hiring, delegation, and decision making. Well, I'm a point guard, and I read a lot of leadership books, and almost all of them are books that look like a point guard wrote them and, uh, and, and just put fancy language on it. Um, so let me describe what you do when you're a point guard, and I think you understand how I lead. Um, number one, the point guard sits down with the coach always, and they work through what the master plan is. The coach may have the design already, but the point guard has to nuance it. You have to have a master plan, and the point guard has to know it backwards and forwards. The next thing the point guard does is he's got to talk to the team, and he's got to talk the plan up. So you have to be a communicator. That A big part of my leadership style is communicating what the plan is and talking it up in positive terms. And then when you're a really good point guard, you always go work one-on-one -on -one with members of the team. You don't just assume because you told the team individually uh, or as a, as a collective that they're going to understand it. You work with the individual players on the team on their skills so they can implement under duress. And so the one-on-one -on -one mentoring engagement of a point guard or a leader is extremely important. And then what you have to do if you want this to really work is you gotta have a scrimmage. You gotta put yourself in a situation where you're applying a game plan, but the stakes aren't as high. I call that, and, and I hope my faculty colleagues and staff colleagues and student colleagues don't take this uh, the wrong way, but when the leadership creates a plan, the best place to scrimmage is with the faculty, staff, and students in the governance function because you sharpen up our ideas. And that's a big part of what you have to do when you're the point guard. Next is game time. So now you're implementing and executing. While you're executing, you have to refresh everybody on the key concepts. You have to be reflective of the, of the progress you're making and you've gotta be ready to reboot or pivot because it might not be working. And a big part of the leadership strategy is to be able to do that under, under stress and for me, the language people will always hear me say is, the mirror is always up. We're always looking at ourselves, using evidence and data and, and, and people's reactions and responses to figure out what we're doing. That's the point guard life. Now, I wanna, I wanna say this to you because you all just hired a very good point guard there at LSU to lead your women's basketball program. Now, on the men's side, Baylor won the national championship, beating the team that was considered to be historic. How did they do it? 
they basically put two point guards on the floor at one time. If you want to win, you're looking at the second point guard. That's, that's, that's what this is about. So you, you bring people together like that. In terms of hiring, I look for people who are point guards. Now, you can't always find a person who thinks just the way I described. They may have individual talents that fit the master plan. Piece by piece, you put your team together based upon the, the strategic plan you have and the blind spots. A big part of me, I, I put a mirror up all the time. I know what I don't do well. I always have somebody on the team who fits my blind spot. And I, say, and I tell them, look, I don't do that well. And I need you basically to make sure that this happens. And, and that's how I, I operate in terms of the hiring. Look for point guard type mentality and then specialized talent based upon the strategic plan. I look for people who are truth seeking, courageous and empathetic, always. Um, in terms of delegation, the more responsibility you have, the more you delegate. It's an inverse relationship in terms of leadership. If you begin to micromanage at a, at a scale, uh, it, you, your, your, your operation just won't work. So I believe in hiring people who actually can get the job done. And based upon the developmental process I just described for you, I work with them one-on-one -on -one in scrimmages and under duress to make sure we can execute. And in terms of decision-making, of course, I'm a social scientist. I enjoy getting great information and data where that's possible. I use information and data to drive decision making as well as the thinking of my team. And, but, but not all situations are data driven. And so there I, I fall back on core values. For me, the core value in higher education is what does this mean for students? And ultimately, if it's not going to be, if it's not going to benefit students, if it's not going to advance the student experience, if it's not going to be student centered, then it's something we probably need to think about not doing. Everything is about the students in higher education. And so faculty, no, no offense, but we're here because of them. And um, staff, same thing. We're here because of the students. And so that's how I think about the world, point guard driven. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Jessica Jones, would you please uh, ask the next question? You have seen LSU Title IX issues in too many headlines. How do we make protection of students faculty and staff from sexual harassment, discrimination, and assault, a hard line priority for all institutions of the LSU system. I'd like to answer your question uh, from a personal perspective and uh, maybe, you know, as epidemiologist, more technical. So in my current capacity, um, just like LSU, um, we obviously have individuals on our campus who are problematic and uh, harassing individuals, predators in my opinion. Um, and, I, and I have to deal with it in two ways. I have an archeological dig of individuals who may have been engaged in this kind of behavior who predate me and those who might come across my desk in real time. Um, more recently, I had one to come across my desk in real time. It, it didn't go through a Title IX situation. I was literally sitting in a restaurant, looking at my phone, reading a newspaper article about the individual in a lawsuit. When I went into the office the next day, I moved the person off the campus. Um, we couldn't fire them initially from their faculty position, but uh, their administrative role, I relieved them of the duties immediately. And um, that's from a personal perspective, I'm just gonna be very clear with you. If it comes across my desk in real time and I have reasonable evidence, um, I'm moving the individuals on quickly. You cannot keep predators on your campus. The archaeological dig um, is a little more difficult uh, because a lot of times people have been adjudicated already and uh, you're then going back and storyboarding, trying to figure out what happened. Um, I don't believe everything I read in the Chronicle of Higher Education or the New York Times because I'm, I'm living it right now and I know what kind of paperwork I have in front of me and what the New York Times and the Chronicle says. So I, I, have, I have empathy for those of you trying to manage that. Um, that said, let, let's deal with the technical as an epidemiologist. Frankly, I believe in a, a trauma-informed approach. I think we should not be in the business of re-traumatizing individuals. We have to assume that if someone comes to us, they have a history of trauma and our systems have to be built for that. And if, if you don't do that, it's a complete fail. Um, we have to make sure there's safety involved, that they're trustworthy and transparent, peer support, collaborative, um, we have to empower them. If, you know, if they come to us, 
and we have to attend to cultural, historical, and gender uh, related issues. Um, I think that there are some best practices um, based upon public health approaches um, to dealing with this, as well as legal practices. But as I said to you in my letter, uh, in the area of uh, sexual misconduct, I think we're duty bound to prioritize safety and to administer to justice as quickly as possible. And uh, anyone who's accused of this, I think we have to remove them from our campus immediately until those situations are uh, determined to be uh, true or false. The next question will come from Hannah Barrios, Ms. Barrios. Hey, good afternoon, Dr. Tate. How would you ensure that LSU campuses remain student-centered? Please describe how you interact with and engage students, specifically in the area of fostering student success. How do you incorporate student input and respond to their needs and concerns? For me, the only reason I'm doing this is because of you, uh, quite frankly. Um, and rather than say how I would ensure, let me give you a couple of examples and then I'll back into your, your first question. Um, uh, as, a gra as a department chair, um, I always work directly with the students who were in our, our various honor societies and in the various leadership groups in our departments. Um, they were central to everything I did and I tried to uh, basically integrate myself into the nexus of not just their academic work, but their uh, co-curricular activities outside of the classroom and really be central to that. That gave me a real heart for students. I got to see um, what they were experiencing directly. Then as it, when I became a Dean, um, before I took the job, I met with um, the undergraduate student. And, and I'm gonna say something, usually when we say student at a university, we're usually talking about undergrads. I wanna be transparent. I think that's a mistake. We're talking about undergrads, grads, and professional students. And so when I say student, I mean all three. And uh, my, my first job uh, outside of being chair was uh, being a, a dean of the graduate school. Before I started, I met with the graduate student senate members and uh, asked them directly, what did they need me to do to be successful in the role uh, and from their perspective? And, and every year after that we met, I asked them to write for me uh, a strategic plan that was my charge. In other words, I didn't take my charge necessarily from the provost. I said to the provost, we need to do what the students need us to do because that, they're the ones who need to be successful. And let me give you some examples of the things we were able to accomplish as a team. Um, at the time, the students who were uh, graduate students, PhD students did not have full healthcare benefits. Um, they were subsidizing part of their benefit structure. They asked me to address that. Um, at the time, um, there was not a floor for graduate student stipends. There were some students who really weren't able to live uh, in a large metropolitan city uh, given the stipend amount. And together, we worked through a process over a, a six year run where we took care of the healthcare benefits for the students who were RAs, TAs, and PhD students on fellowships, including master's students. And we also um, were able to create a floor across every school and college at the university in terms of the stipends so that they would have the equivalent of a $15 an hour stipend. They weren't hourly workers, but we wanted to make sure that um, they were lined up that way. Um, together, um, um, these kinds of things were accomplished year to year. So they asked for better career services. We invested in career services so that they would have an opportunity uh, for academic careers. And many of them wanted careers outside of the academy. And most of the career function is uh, organized for undergraduate students. So we made sure that we provided for the graduate students. Here at the University of South Carolina, um, my first act, I call it the past president of uh, the student body who was still in town and the current president and uh, many other, other uh, folks who engaged in the governance process. And we meet just on, to have breakfast to talk about the university and get their insights. I also work directly again with the student government functions and replicated the same process for graduate students that we did at Washington University with the University of South Carolina students here. I just met with them a couple of days ago about putting together a package for graduate student healthcare. Um, again, charging them to work with me and to meet with me on a regular basis to make sure they could hold me accountable to actually getting those things done. And I meet with all the student, uh, 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 the student senators from undergrad call me and we talk on Teams, we don't use Zoom, and just go through things that I think that they wanna get done. They tell me what the things they wanna get done. I, 
get done. I explain to them how the university works and help them walk through so that they don't get roadblocks and actually attaining the things that they want. It's extremely important for me. Um, I really have great respect for the students who volunteer their time in, in the governance functions. But I also know that the governance functions don't totally represent all the students because all the students don't engage them. And so I try to do other things to get involved, show up at any kind of event I can and meet as many students as I can so that I can hear their voices and actually try to use that to inform what, what I'm doing. And that's really been the most gratifying part of being provost, um, integrating that into my day-to-day -day strategy. So if you ask me what I would do um, if I were president, um, I would model that behavior for everyone else and hold them accountable to engaging in that way. Because I think that's what we should be doing as universities. We shouldn't be outsourcing our engagement with students. We should actually be engaging with them. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dean Mitchell, would you please ask the next question? Sure, good afternoon, uh, Provost Tate. And just as an aside, I wanna tell you, thank you for the work that you did as the former president of the American Educational Research Association. The leadership that you provided then is still showing through today. So thank you for that service, sir. Um, so Provost Tate, tell us how you would approach leading and working with faculty. What are your views of faculty governance? Please describe your previous experience in leading, supporting, and or growing research and scholarly activity. Thank you uh, for the compliment. That was 2008, and um, I still have post-traumatic from uh, the, all, all the hard work from that, but I appreciate it. Um, you know, the um, thing about my background and my history is I started at the University of Wisconsin as a professor, and at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, faculty governance is central. In fact, it is the model for the rest of the United States um, based upon um, history and, and how strong it is there. So it's part of my DNA. Uh, I firmly believe the faculty governance uh, role is, is extremely important. Here at the University of South Carolina, I work very closely um, with the chair of the faculty senate. Um, we, we meet on a regular basis. Um, I, I go to the steering committee of the faculty senate, I go, and I add, added on the faculty welfare committee because we're in the middle of a pandemic, and I thought it was extremely important that they hear from me on a regular basis about how, we're, how we were managing the pandemic on the academic affairs side. So, I needed to hear from them because they have great expertise as well. Um, from, from my perspective, um, we need to take advantage of the faculty expertise and no greater time have I ever seen it happen than our experience here at the University of South Carolina where faculty who were epidemiologists were laying out and delineating the models for us to guide us through the pandemic. That's the ultimate of faculty governance. That's what this is about. Similarly, in our pharmacy school, um, they led the effort to get our COVID testing up and really are providing the feedback structure along with uh, wastewater testing, amazing part of faculty governance. For me, I believe that's the way um, all this should operate. I'll give some other examples based upon questions that are coming up subsequently, but faculty governance is a part of the DNA that I operate in and I would wanna partner with the faculty. And if there's a staff governance function, the same in the student government func go governance function, the same, extremely important part of what should happen. Um, I'll say, um, that um, this year uh, I tried to uh, engage the faculty through town halls and the like because we couldn't meet face to face. We just used every tool and strategy we could um, and faculty and staff town halls were a big part of um, what I tried to do. I, I'll uh, speak a little bit about um, leading, um, supporting research and the like, which is really the heart of who I've been as an intellectual. I mean, you mentioned AERA and really that was a national role we were attempt attempting to stimulate research, social science and humanistic research that would advance our understanding of human development broadly defined. It's a critical part of who I am. Um, I've had about 20, 20 plus million dollars of external research funding myself. Um, much of it I used to be catalytic for other people, bringing them onto the team and working with them uh, to get their grants off the ground I had a center for teaching and learning that was a catalytic in that way at, at um, the university. But, but let me give you a, a, a few more examples from um, building academic programs because that's part of the deal. So when I was dean of the graduate school at, at Washington University in St. Louis, um, one of the strategies I always thought about is we had some highly ranked programs and some programs that weren't as highly ranked, <clears throat> but they provided methodological or technical skills that were deeply needed in those highly ranked programs. So here's an example. 
at Washington University, uh, social work is ranked number two in the United States of America. Political methodology is a top 10 program. Outstanding social scientists in those areas. Psychological and brain sciences, which is part of our DBBS, is also highly ranked, considered you know, a top 15 program. However, our computer science program might have been ranked 40th, 45th. And for me, my mind went with, what if we leveraged and built a division where students entered into that division and they could take the computer science classes, gain that technical skill, and also engage um, with one of these highly ranked programs. And then they ultimately could decide where they wanted to get their PhD, computer science, psychological and brain sciences, political science, or social work. And then they would have the benefit of the technical expertise and being touched by the highly ranked programs. You see what I mean? This is winning. And so, so we did this over and over again and we modeled um, everything we did after bringing together methodological and technical expertise with highly ranked endeavors. I seeded the money for that and worked with the engineering dean um, who is a great colleague as well as the chairs in those departments and served as ambassador to get it jumped off. Um, we also built out uh, infrastructure um, for our PhD students in unique ways. For example, there was a 72 credit requirement to get a PhD at Washington University. Using data and holding a mirror up, we realized our competitors had eliminated the 72 credit requirement. Now I have pushed back from some of my colleagues about eliminating the requirement. But when we held the mirror up, and found out where they earned their PhDs. Most of them earned their PhDs at places that did not have a 72 credit requirement. And the reason the 72 credit requirement exists is largely legislative uh, endeavors. In other words, people just need to count the credits, but you don't actually need the credits. What you need is a thesis that's of the first order. You do not need 72 credits. And, and we eliminated it, moving our folks to degree uh, completion faster, and with uh, greater opportunities for external research post, um, uh, post finishing because they didn't have to sit through all the courses, they could just get right to the actual research. We also created um, opportunities for our students to have uh, what we call a mentor professional experience and a mentor teaching experience. We moved away, we eliminated the teaching assistant at Washington University under my leadership because the teaching assistantship as a funding source was just keeping people in place, running a, a, a track meet on a treadmill. They couldn't finish fast enough. And so we turned teaching into a mentored experience. We turned professional development or professional education where they might do something in a, a career outside of the academy as part of the endeavor. And in doing so, um, we put ourselves in a highly competitive situation to advance our scholarship, to advance the scholarship of the students, in fact, many students then were uh, completing in a faster pace. That saves you money. You can reallocate that money for new students, generating more research and the like. And finally, here, when I arrived at the University of South Carolina, the first thing I asked myself is, if we wanted to be an AAU school, which was part of the strategic plan, what is our research capacity? What's the physical infrastructure like? Um, and that's what we've been working on right now, building out strategies so that we can share physical infrastructure across the entity, making sure that we have elite science going on. And it's not school or college based, but it's institution based and it's funding based. That's a huge difference because right now, I know you're a dean, deans like to control space. But if somebody in chemistry has a grant and you have the space, but no grant, then we've got to have a mechanism to facilitate them actually using the space. And that's the kind of thing I've been working on to maximize our research capacity at this institution. It's been quite exciting so far. Thank you. <clears throat> next up, we have Chancellor Larry Clark. Chancellor Clark, would you please ask our next question? <clears throat> Glad to do so by former student. You've done well, sir. <laughs> uh, in a time of limited and even shrinking resources, Budgeting and resource allocations are important responsibilities. Budget cuts to higher education have resulted in many unfilled faculty and staff positions, lagging salaries, fewer graduate students, and higher tuition and overhead fees. How can the LSU system begin to address some of these inequities over the next five years without assuming higher budgets? 
I like the fact that you said without us needing higher budgets because no one ever cut their way to excellence. There has never been an example of a higher education institution that cut, cut, cut and became great. It simply doesn't happen. So we're, we're put in a situation where if our budgets are frozen, then we have to make very hard decisions about allocation. And the issue about allocation is a discipline around strategy. And what I have found is we democratize mediocrity. So we invest in everything without making a decision about what's important. So the first step is to decide what are the important factors that we are going to invest in, not just as a flagship, but that to, across the institution, and where are the interdependencies that we can take advantage of? Once you have a convincing set of strategies that you are going to pour your resources into, then you can do a couple of things. And I know there's some questions on this. Number one, you've got to raise money. <laughs> Number two, you have to build a very close relationship with the government agencies in the community, the governor, the legislative body, because you have to be able, be able to go and make strong arguments for fungible money, because fungible money is going to give you greater opportunity to move things around and actually uh, attain the goals you wish to do. Um, I think that that's a key part of what has to happen. You know, I don't know the exact um, budget parameters there at LSU in terms of how much you get from the state. I know that here in South Carolina, we get 9% from the state and it's been stuck at that for some time. So um, we're committed here on the affordability front to um, not raise tuition. And obviously from a, uh, the perspective you heard from me, that's something I, I really adhere to. The way we've been able to manage it is, um, of course, to grow our enrollment. That's an extremely important process. And we're also an attractive environment for out-of-state students. I know LSU is a place that um, is really committed to in-state students. I 100% concur with that. However, there are opportunities um, if you expand your enrollment to keep the actual numbers of students in Louisiana uh, in your pool and then uh, add out-of-state students and have them uh, help subsidize. And I think it's extremely important that their subsidies uh, where possible be used to give scholarships to students in-state. That's an extremely, that, that really makes a big difference politically and it actually adds a lot of value. And then I think that um, we were just talking about the research infrastructure. Research is very expensive. However, uh, I believe that it's incumbent upon us to uh, go out and get as much uh, as we can on the research front while partnering with philanthropic groups to actually add value. I'll speak a little bit about that um, when we get to the question on development, but I think all of these are the things that have to be combined. Um, and, and, and can I just say, frankly, you know this, sir, as a chancellor, um, you take advantage of every unique and distinct opportunity that manifests itself. And a lot of people will, will make me get on this call and tell you it's all the strategy, but point of fact, we've just got to be out here working and hustling as hard as we can in order to generate the money. That's how it really works, folks. I, so, I, don't, I, I don't know what people really think happens, but that's the real game. And so that's what I enjoy doing, the whole hunt for that. And, um, and then you take advantage of it and you really can move the needle. Thank you. Uh, Board of Supervisor Member Valencia Jones, would you please ask the next question? Thank you. Dr. Tate, please discuss your commitment to an experience enhancing diversity, including diversity as it relates to underrepresented groups, as well as diversity of thought, experience, et cetera. Let me begin with diversity of thought because that's often uh, ignored. I believe the university is a place where ideas are central. I told you truth seeking is a paramount part of my value system. As a result of that, um, I understand that people will come with different thoughts. When I was an instructor or a teacher, I always asked my students to frame their remarks as whether or not they were based upon something they think or whether it's based upon some empirical evidence and to justify it based upon um, the evidence to bear or a logic. And even if people didn't agree, uh, I asked for the most civil of engagements. The best example I've ever seen this is during um, my time at the Washington University during the stem cell initiative amendment was put forth about embryonic stem cells. 
two faculty members at the university, both Christian men, both scientists, went on a tour debating the merits and won for and won against. And they went around the state of Missouri to model how to disagree in a civil fashion. So I'm 100% starting with that. Because if we don't have that, we don't have a university. That's foundational. With respect to uh, uh, student diversity and the like, obviously I'm committed to that um, because I've actually been a beneficiary and it would be shameful if I wasn't. But, but let me speak to specific things. In 2014, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, when Michael Brown was killed. Our university got together and asked, what are we going to do about it? It was stunning to me because I had spent the, the period of time between 2002 and 2014 studying St. Louis, which is the only majority minority county outside of the deep south. And here we are asking, what are we going to do? The thing that I responded with and what I told my colleagues then when I was on the university's cabinet was that there were outstanding researchers and scholars and practitioners at Washington University who had been studying these matters for years. We had never even brought them together to have a conversation about how their research and development activities were applicable to making our community better. And so that's what we did. And we did it and I chaired that, co-chaired that with the Dean of Law uh, and our Student Affairs VP for about a five year run. We ultimately wrote a book bringing all those best practices together and laying out um, how, and we call it the day of dialogue and discovery. And each year we had a different theme, but our point was we can model how to do this. And that's what the university should do. As a Dean um, in the graduate school and here at the University of South Carolina, um, I have uh, used the budget process to enhance uh, fellowships that are uh, devoted to students who are underrepresented um, in the academy. Um, the Olin Graduate Fellowship was one of the most important ones that I engaged with at Washington University. That was the largest network of women working on professional degrees in the United States. Um, I also um, worked with the Chancellor's Graduate Fellowship Program, which was focused on initially African-American students, and then it went to African-American students and those who were interested in studying uh, people of African descent. Um, we expanded that program. And we did it in ways based upon what the research told us. It had initially been a pure PhD program, but research was telling us we were missing students who uh, were at the master's level. We expanded that to include master's students to get more students into the pipeline. We also went uh, around the country and really marketed our programs very strongly to make that happen. I replicated that here at the University of South Carolina and expanded it. Um, now, because I'm provost, um, we're starting a postdoctoral program to diversify our faculty ranks and what I have tried to do here is to create a developmental pipeline. So I'm working with historically black colleges in um, the state of South Carolina. We're doing three, two and four, one programs. We're also gonna admit some students who are um, gonna be in, in uh, what I would call uh, scaffolding or boot camp programs. All those students will be fully funded. And then we will try to leverage them and put them into our Grace McFadden Scholars Program for masters and PhD students, thus pipelining them in and then those students who wish to stay will be eligible for the postdoc program. We're gonna grow our own faculty here because the excuse about there's nobody um, in the pipeline is not one I could accept. And so we just built our own um, using the budget process and reallocation processes here. Uh, I'm very excited about that. And, and um, to be frank, I tried to part, do this in the SEC, but uh, I didn't get a whole lot of support other than from your provost who actually was supportive of it. Um, everybody else in the SEC backed off uh, not kicking them to the curb on, um, on the recording, but that was the fact. And uh, so I'm excited and that gave me um, really a, another reason why I was excited about having this conversation because we were like minds on that front. Thank you, Dr. Faye. <clears throat> Ms. Slaughter, would you please ask the next question? Yes, thank you, Chairman Williams. Uh, Provost Tate, thank you again for being here with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. My question is, COVID-19 has dramatically impacted campus life and daily life. What are your thoughts for fall semester 2021 and beyond for extended or new COVID protocols? Well, you know, I wrote papers on this. So you're like, you're all in my lane now. I'm loving this. So, um, you know, the beauty is the CDC is, is, is an elite. 
So we have, we have great information from the CDC. Um, recently, um, they've just talked about the masking um, outdoors and um, that if you're vaccinated, the outdoor situation um, is, is, is pretty safe. I, I agree with that. I think we're going to be we're going to be in good shape, other than very large crowds where we probably will still need masks. Um, that speaks to whether or not we can open our classrooms up. I believe right now, and I and I know in my experience, we did not have one transmission of of the the virus in a, from a classroom uh, situation based upon our contact tracing. So I feel very confident that the classrooms can be open in the fall, especially in light of the vaccine. We have two vaccines with efficacy that are widely available now. Um, that's, that, that speaks uh, volumes about where we are. And um, j and I think is, you know, um, I know it's, you know, it's six out of six million with women um, being the, the group that was problematic. I would probably not recommend it for women right now. I, I can't say that, I guess I just said it, but, but I would say use the other two. I would say use the other two and men can do j and j especially um, young men who, um, may only want to do it one time and we want to get our students vaccinated. I don't think we can mandate the vaccination um, largely because it still has that emergency status. However, I think we can, uh, we have great, uh, the randomized control trials are pretty strong and I think I feel comfortable telling people um, that the uh, technology is excellent. And this is what I would say though to you now. Um, so bottom line, I think we need to be open. I think we can have sporting events. I think we can do all those kinds of things um, and, and do them in a safe fashion if we follow the CDC protocols. But there, there, there are about four things that I wanna recommend. Number one, our communication strategies have to be extremely strong. Um, right now, I, I feel like they break down a bit and you're a massive system. So you should be communicating right now to all students incoming and current about vaccination and you want them vaccinated by the fall, all the faculty should be on board and every faculty who's hesitant, they should be have access to people who can talk to them about what, what in the world is going on with this vaccine. And the CDC protocols will morph based upon where we are. So you need to be prepared to jumpstart a communication strategy um, July 1, based upon where we are with the pandemic, with clear data based upon uh, Louisiana, because that's where the preponderance of your students are from, and then backtracking where you get um, the other students from to make sure that in those areas, they don't, they're not hot spots and you can work with those students as they come on board. Clearly they need to be tested and you need to, where possible, incur, again, encourage vaccine. Um, I also think um, that it's extremely important um, that we uh, utilize the research capacities on our campuses and really get folks involved in the ways I described before. You have outstanding public health fish folks there uh, and, and many, many health professionals getting them involved in the actual process uh, in standups and as a team is extremely important. And then finally, I think, you know, evaluating constantly the processes and then kicking back to the communication strategy, making sure that everybody knows what's going on. Um, that's a full-time job. And I think it's gonna be a full-time job going forward uh, until we get to a place where um, that this, this particular virus is probably having the effects of a typical flu virus. So just, just buckle up, this is where we are. Thank you, Previs. Thank you. Um, I now call on Dr. Lester Wayne Johnson to ask the next question. Good afternoon, Dr. Tate. Thank you for your attention to us this afternoon. Uh, you've already discussed this to some degree, but we'd like to uh, have your ideas once again on your fundraising experience and thoughts on additional revenue generation opportunities for our university. And if you would uh, give us some examples that you may have. Yes, sir. Well, let me start with a, a couple of things that I believe are axiomatic with respect to fundraising. Um, requests without relationships results in rejection and development of fundraising operates at the speed of relationships. That's what it is. It's a relationship business. And if you're not in the relationship business, you cannot engage in uh, fundraising at scale. Um, my own experiences, uh, I've been very fortunate. I spent 18 years at Washington University. Our last capital campaign generated $3.378 million, billion dollars, billion. We started off with a $2.2 billion goal and we got rolling and we kept going. Um, how do you do that? 
Let me start from a developmental perspective. First thing, if I were to come to LSU and I ask the question, what percentage of students, staff, and faculty give to annual giving? What percentage of students, staff, faculty, and staff give to the United Way? If it's low, then it suggests that you, where there's a need to cultivate a climate of giving. Oftentimes, what we think is, I pay tuition, I don't have to give anymore. What our, what our students and families don't understand is they have been subsidized by the federal government, the state government, and a historical subsidy. They're not paying for the full freight. And we've got to help them understand that giving back, even and over and above tuition, is an important part of the cultivation process. Secondly, um, you've got to look at your team in development. Scope and scale, depending on how, how much you want to raise, everything is a function of how big your team is. If your team's not big enough, you're not going to raise any money because they can't, they're not going to develop the relationships at scale that are necessary. Now let's give us some specific examples. Um, I started at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as an assistant professor. As an assistant professor, I was chair of the development team for my department as an assistant professor. So I've been doing it for 30 years. I work on building relationships. Part of what you have to do is to go on the road and talk about the kinds of work that's happening at the university. And it's gotta be done in a targeted fashion so the people you're talking to actually have an interest in the area in which you're gonna bring the expertise. So marrying people together. So here's a WashU example. I was responsible for the board, in, in particular, the research and graduate affairs part of the, of the board of directors. At every meeting, I put before them an outstanding researcher who was doing something that would demonstrate innovation in the unique ways. And in every meeting afterwards, I would go to dinner and talk to them about that research. That led to five endowed chairs in chemistry because we had presenters from chemistry who were elite. My point is you've got to create the context in which people can really see and feel what the research is doing and then follow up with them with an ask. It's straightforward. We pulled it off in that environment. Similarly, while I was a department chair at Washington University, I received a $10 million grant from the National Science Foundation. About 53% of that goes to indirects to the university. So 5.3 mil goes back to the university. The university said, we're gonna build you a building. I said, fine. Later, they said, we were only gonna build the building for your department, but we like to build a building for multiple social science departments. I said, fine. You know, I don't control the 5.3, you do. Let's leverage the 5.3 million and go get additional money. So I was part of a group that made the case to build the social science building in Washington University Siegel Hall, which is one of the finest social science buildings you ever, ever see, largely with conversations with that benefactor, explaining to him the importance of the work and the fact that we had already leveraged money through uh, external uh, NSF dollars to add value to that environment. And we, we just poured other people in who brought external dollars in and we just made it work. Over and over again, I can give you examples of that. Here in, at, in the University of South Carolina, I'm speaking about fundraising, but there's a lot of ways to raise money. Um, here, I work um, directly with my colleagues in economic development, and we work with our um, colleagues who work in, uh, for example, health and human services and other units, secured about $8 million from them in the last 10 months, just to build out a partnership with Prisma Health and uh, other health providers with our public health folks. It's going over, making a case, and having a conversation about it, and giving them an idea, some big ideas to work with. Um, I think that that's, I don't know how many examples you want, but I got millions of dollars worth of them. And this is what I do. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a matter of being in the context and dreaming big. And our current strategic planning here, um, my responsibility is to dream of the big ideas and to go out and talk to them with the benefactors and help them understand why these ideas are extremely important. 
It's something I've just been doing for the last 30 years. I'm very comfortable doing it and have a track record of success. Moreover, sir, I know what a bad team looks like and a good team looks like. And if we have a bad team, we're going to fix it because you can't win at scale for a place like LSU if your team's not organized and you can advance the uh, enterprise in that way. So it's not just about one person being a personality. It's about can you build a team and execute in such a way that you could actually fulfill the requirements or the goals of a strategic, of a, of a capital campaign. And I think that's the important part. I, I'm, I'm a product of really a place that was elite at doing that. All right, and our final question, we will look to Chairman-elect of the Board of Supervisors, Remy Starnes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Tate, what is your vision for the success of LSU athletics and its role in the holistic development of LSU student athletes? Well, I'm gonna tell you real talk. I wanna win a national championship and everything. I mean, so, so, so I'm not, that was the easiest question I saw on the list. What in the heck else would you want to do? But, 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 but let me back up one second, sir. There are a few universities in this country where it's possible to win a Heisman Trophy and a Nobel Prize. And if I ask you to name those universities, I bet you could. Michigan. UCLA. Now there are a lot of places you can win the Heisman. And there are a lot of places that you can win the Nobel Prize, but not a lot of places where you could do both. So my vision is this, LSU sports is a brand that's global. And I, I, before people think I'm just talking about the flagship campus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to know I'm talking about all the, all the campuses, but I'll get to that. But we talked to flagship first. And my goal would be to create a context in which student athletes can win national championships while working and engaging in an academic environment where the very, very best people who could actually win Nobel Prizes are there and those student athletes can engage in that. And that's part of how you recruit them. Now, you might say, that's a pipe dream. That's my job is the dream. And so I would love to see that. And I would love to see LSU join the ranks of the institutions where you can win both. And I know that there are uh, across the system, the NAIA, uh, many of the schools are in that. I have the same mindset, compete for the national championship in that division, but have individuals who are, who are complete, who are outstanding on the faculty ranks, be able to provide uh, a scholar athlete with a true experience. So I come from this from the faculty rep point of view. And my thing is, do they graduate, sir? If they don't graduate, it's not successful unless they're going to the league. So I want a system that documents and reflects and has a mirror to ensure that the student athletes who matriculate seeking those national championships earn college degrees and in my own experiences, as I said in, in the letter, I want those student athletes also to have an experience where they can do internships, where they can engage in research and not compromise um, their, uh, their, their desires to be great in athletics. And if we can do that, we've done them a great service. And if we have created a context where you can win the, the Heisman and or and the Nobel, based upon all the prior questions. In my opinion, that means, that means LSU is in the big time in terms of the way um, universities are viewed across the globe. And that's, that's what I would wanna see. And it's really pretty simple, but it just would take a lot of work. And your first 11 questions, your first 10 questions would have to be answered in the right way. Thank you. Those are all of the questions and I would be remiss if I didn't say that I'm, I'm sitting next to a Nobel Prize winner right now. So I'm very proud that LSU is among the ranks of folks who have both the Heisman and the Nobel Prize. Did I, did I miss a Nobel Prize winner at LSU? Yeah, get the camera on. Let's do it. Come on. Man. I was not a winner. I was part of the team. <laughs> oh. Yeah. 
Well, let me just say this then. A second Nobel Prize winner and <laughs> <laughs> an additional Heisman Trophy winners because you are in the ranks with UCLA now and Michigan and LSU. And I offer my sincere apologies and congratulations. Thank you. So do you, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Do you have any questions for the committee? Sure, the, the one that comes up that's transparent uh, based upon um, reading the newspaper articles and the like is that uh, you obviously had some conversations about whether this role uh, would be uh, for the flagship institution or whether it's gonna be a systems role. I'm wondering where you are on thinking about this role in terms of uh, what is the unit of leadership that uh, you, you settled on uh, for the position. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question uh, because I think there has been uh, a fair amount of media uh, confusion about that fact. This committee met in the very beginning of this process uh, to deliberate and decide on a job description that uh, in doing so, in deliberating and deciding on that job description, we weighed many factors, structural and otherwise. And at the conclusion of that process and before beginning this search, this committee authorized by the LSU Board of Supervisors agreed on a job description. And the job description that was put out for the world to see is the job description that we are, are advertising for. And I, I know I can speak for my colleagues on the, on the Board of Supervisors that it would be, it would be unfair for us to um, uh, change the job description in the, in the middle of the search. And uh, so I'm here to say that this committee and this system uh, is going to, is we are looking for someone to fill the description that, that we approved. And that is the, obviously the consolidated position. Thank you. Let, let me ask again, uh, another system question, you know, and I don't want, I, 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 I could have probably asked, you know, pre-interview, um, but the, strategic planning documents that I was sent. Um, again, I was a little confused whether or not those documents were organized for the LSU Baton Rouge campus or whether the documents were organized for the system. The one that definitely said um, for the state, I, I understood to be for the totality of the enterprise. It, has there been a strategic planning process for the system to deal with the interdependencies? You know, like I, I imagine in my mind, as I state, stated in the letter, I, I, I concern myself with rural areas and urban areas. They're very different, but they have, but they often, if you don't plan, um, you, you don't get a chance to really serve them in the ways that you could. And I, I could not tell, are those documents uh, system-wide or not? I saw you, you want to address that? <laughs> Do I have... I'm going to punt that to uh, Dr. LaVore, thankfully. Okay, well, and I, I'm actually going to ask for input from others, but I've reviewed those documents extensively, and I share your confusion uh, in that process. But my reading um, and, and understand that I am not in the administration of the university. So my reading as a faculty member of those documents is that they're very much flagship uh, campus centered and that I would hope that one of the early roles would be of the new presidents would be to take that work and restart it and build on it and uh, and create something that is more inclusive of the LSU system. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize Chancellor Clark who has a follow up. The process of creating what you see began on the A&M campus. However, it was then talked about in a two day retreat that occurred over on the, here on the campus about whether or not it could align to the other entities within LSU. And we each took it up with our constituency on our campuses. We did align to it. Uh, at LSU Shreveport, we have that plan. We were allowed to have some differences to it. We have in one of them, we have sort of a it's like a 3A, 3B rather than just a three. Uh, it was amazing how much uh, commonality we found in what we were able to do to come back to it. That said, I would like to see us have a very strategic plan, which is not that one, and that we could do better. But in terms of the answer of whether or not it involves the, uh, my colleague sitting next to me from uh, Eunice, 
Alexandria, the medical schools, the Pennington, the answer is yes, it does include them. I'm gonna put on my medical hat for a second. Thank you for that response. Um, I'm very curious um, about rural um, uh, healthcare services and uh, medical services in the state. Um, has, there, has there been any planning or effort to ensure that the, that the institution broadly is uh, being impactful in, our, in the rural communities of Louisiana, which I think it's extremely important if, if you're gonna get at anything that was in that, in the six bullets in the, the flagship uh, document. Um, oh, oh uh, Lester Wayne Johnson, would you mind addressing that? Uh, that's a wonderful question. I appreciate the sensitivity of that question. You couldn't be more correct between the differentiation and needs of the urban and, and rural areas in, in all of our states, but in particular Louisiana with vast, vast rural uh, hinterland that we have. There's been countless uh, initiatives to uh, identify problems so that we could uh, effectively counteract these problems. Unfortunately, we start, uh, doctor, in the absolute epicenter of poverty in the Mississippi Delta. It is a huge problem, but it is a wonderful opportunity for us with somebody with the sensitivity to understand the opportunity for the United States and Louisiana to study and to counteract the generational, cross-generational poverty and the healthcare problems that, it, that, it, uh, that ensues from it. LSU has been a leader in trying to work on these problems, both in the inner city and in, and in the Delta. This continues. This is one of the things that I am proudest of, of LSU in the last few decades. But there is, of course, because of where we started, miles to go before we sleep. But this is something that is on our radar constantly. We understand the difference between urban and, and rural uh, problems. And I believe that this is an opportunity for LSU, as you alluded to, nationally to set a standard in both uh, research and development. I thank you for that. It's a personal issue for me. My grandmother's from the Mississippi Delta, and um, I, I know how often uh, you know, that those areas don't get the attention they, they deserve. Thank you for that. Could I add one thing? The, uh, sure. I uh, recognize Dr. Nelson with a comment. I'm from the School of Medicine in uh, New Orleans. So we have a, you know, most of Louisiana is underserved in terms of physicians. Um, and so we're designated as a HIPSA for many, many parts of the state. So we have a program actually at LSU called the Rural Track Scholars Program, where if you're from a rural area of Louisiana and you're willing to go back to that area to provide primary care mm -hmm. services, we will give you free tuition to the medical school for four years. And for those four years of free tuition, we ask for six years of service in a rural area of Louisiana. And what most studies have shown is that once you set up a practice uh, in an area, you tend to go back to that area. So it's actually one of the most successful programs in the United States of America. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Chairman, can I add something, please? Sure, Miss, I uh, recognize Ms. Jessica Jones. Hi, uh, Dr. Tate. I'm at LSU Eunice, which is our two-year rural campus, and we service the Tri-Parish area of St. Landry Parish, Evangeline, and Acadia. And so one thing that we've been able to do really well is that we've expanded capacity in our allied health programs. For our nursing programs, we're at the 90, percent, uh, 90 percentile for graduation rate and placement. Our RAT tech program has 100 percent graduation and placement rates. And recently we received, we're the, we're the first institution in the state of Louisiana to receive the Achieving the Dream Rural uh, Resiliency Program for the future of work. And so what that means is we're, we're tasked with uh, other seven institutions across the United States to lessen those equity gaps and to increase capacities and to create pipelines and pathways, particularly for the rural community. So we envision that we will be a pillar not just for the state of Louisiana, but for our region and the nation 
um, for making sure that individuals in the rural communities are getting educated and that they're able to receive those skills to get to work and to remain in Louisiana because we want them educated here and we want them to stay here so that we can sustain our state. Thank you. Okay, um, at this time, I think we are going to um, end the interview. I welcome our folks from Parker back on. Dr. Tate, thank you very much for joining us. Ms. Thank Wilder, you for the Ms. Opportunity. Thank you very much. Dr. Tate, you can jump off and we'll be in touch ASAP. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right, at this time, uh, it is 3.40. I would like us to take a 15 minute break. So we will come back in at 4.55. Four, I mean, uh, whatever that is. Did I say that right? It's 4.40, it's 440 so let's come back at 4.55. Let's come back at five minutes to five. We'll be in recess, thank you.